we have been blessed the last two Sundays by two remarkable sermons <clears throat> that Brother Norman Hare brought to us. My soul was fed as I listened while we were on vacation and then again last week as I was here with you. I want us today to see Jesus Christ again. For many of us here, new and fresh, one more time, an opportunity to fall in love with him all over again. And for some here, an opportunity for, to fall in love with him for the first time. In Mark chapter 9, we have in verses 1 to 13 the, the passage typically referred to as the transfiguration. We're going to look at 1 through 8 today. And Lord willing, take up the next verses in the coming Sundays. But I hope you found Mark chapter 9 in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you. But I much prefer for you to look in your Bible and see it. I ask you to stand with me as I, as I read this passage and then you follow along in your Bibles. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Oh, what a passage. Isn't this the goal? To see Jesus for who He really is? May the Lord open our eyes today in new and fresh ways, to see the power of the, of the kingdom of God. Thank you. Be seated. Jesus has been previously speaking, if you'll recall, back in, in Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 8, uh, as he feeds, has this feeding of the many thousands of people and, and then encounters the Pharisees and, and uses that encounter with them to teach his disciples not to become uh, infected with the, what he calls the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. He heals a blind man. He asks them who the crowds are saying that he is and, and who do they themselves, the twelve, say that he is. Peter makes that great confession. Jesus is the Christ. And then at that point, he begins to tell about what's coming. We said he begins to really unveil himself. Once they have declared him as the Christ, the, the Messiah, the anointed one, the, the long expected one that all of Israel had anticipated that God would send to deliver Israel from their enemies, Jesus begins to unfold things, unveil things, to pull back the curtain of the mystery a little bit so that they know, and he says this over and over in different ways, we point that out to you, that they know what's coming is not going to be the, the 
heel of his boot on the neck of Rome. But rather, he's going to suffer. As he unfolds this in subsequent teachings, he's going to suffer at the hands of the re religious elite, the most favored religious people in Israel, the people that the common population thought had the favor of God. Jesus would be suffering at their hands. He would die, and he would rise again. And in doing that, he calls them after him. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross. Let him follow me. I've just told you I'm going to lose my life. If you want to save your life, you'll be willing to lose it as well. Difficult teaching. And so they're standing there. They've, they've been instructed. Still trying to take it in, I have no doubt. His own coming death and his passion. How it's going to be essential that they deny themselves if they're going to experience and taste the kingdom of God, if they're going to be his students. And it's with these hard sayings in the background that he takes three of them. The, we, we, we learn to call them the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He's going to take them into something to give them a glimpse of the glory that is coming. So I want us to see this passage just briefly today under, under these five headings. First, the promise of a view of the powerful kingdom of God. Second, the powerful kingdom of God displayed in the transfiguration of Jesus. Third, the terrified response of Peter. Fourth, the powerful statement of God. And then the powerful demonstration of Jesus' superiority. This powerful promise. He said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. What is he talking about? Oh, the commentators will not land on the same page on this. You'll read some that say he's talking about this event that Mark very carefully documents as having taken place six days later. There's some that'll say, well, it is the, it's the resurrection. When after the crucifixion, they, they encounter him and, and he, he, he moves through walls into rooms where they're hiding. Some will even say it's the, it's the second coming. I, I really believe that he's talking about the resurrection. Now watch this now, you, there's, a, there's a movement in prophecy, the term is proleptic. There's sometimes an immediate answer to the prophecy that foreshadows an ultimate answer to the prophecy. That's what you have here. I think the experience six days later is a, is a foretaste of what's coming after the resurrection. It's designed for them to be able to see Jesus through different lenses. You see, put yourself where they have been. They have Long, just like any Jew has longed for Messiah to come, and yet they had some, some misunderstandings, some, some preconceived notions that were not exactly accurate about who Messiah would be and what he would be like. And here he comes. He comes in a very lowly way. That totally shattered the mold. Messiah was supposed to come in majesty. He comes, and he's, his chief critics are the religious people. Well, surely if anybody would have hailed the coming of Messiah, it would have been the religious people. They've seen some powerful, miraculous demonstrations. But still, there's got to be a, a tying up, a binding up inside of them of, is, is, this, is this it? So he's going to take three of them, the inner circle, into a, an arena where they get a glimpse of his glory. And they learn from that to see his power. 
that no matter what's going to happen to him in the future, no matter how bad it seems to get, there is another side to it. There's, a, there's a, an after that. There's a beyond that. And brothers and sisters, we need that reminder today. For the first time since we were a bunch of colonies and our Baptist forefathers were imprisoned in the colonies by people of different religious and denominational persuasions. For the first time, a Christian has been imprisoned. And people, I've been reading commentaries on this, and men are all over the map on this. And you wonder sometimes, have people actually read the Constitution and what it says about this matter? Kim Davis is right. The Supreme Court is wrong. The judge who imprisoned her is wrong. And they're going to continue to get it wrong with you and with me. We need to remember there's a story after this story. There's an end to this which is a new beginning. Never forget that. He promised some standing there would not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come, kingdom of God after it's come with power. I would remind you just briefly, when you go back to do a panoramic study of history, Moses experienced the display of the glory of God. Remember he went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, he comes down and having just, having just seen the hindermost, the backside of God, as God hid, him, hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and passed by, Moses comes back down, his face is beaming so brightly from the Shekinah glory of God, the people say, Moses, cover your face, we're terrified looking at you. And so he did, he put a veil over his face. And the scripture tells us that the, that the glory, the, the shining brightness faded after a season. Isaiah experienced the display of the glory of God when he talks about in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the, the cherubim, the angels were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. His response to that was, woe is me, I, I'm undone. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I've seen the King, the Lord of glory. The demons in the New Testament experienced the glory of God. When Jesus would come up and encounter them, remember, it's interesting to me, the Pharisees missed it. The demons got it. They saw it. They would fall on their faces. What do you have to do with us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? We plead with you by God. Do not torment us. The demons saw the glory of God in the face of Christ. The Apostle Paul experienced it when he was Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus when a bright shining light encountered him and, and he fell off of his horse. And a voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he wasn't quite sure what he was dealing with, but he had enough composure to know that the voice he heard was a, was a voice of God. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. The Apostle John experienced the display of the glory of God, not only here, but on the island of Patmos. When he fell on his face as if dead in the presence of a manifestation of the glory of God. So what's my point? My point is, if you've ever tasted the glory of God, you you're at once gripped with your sin and at the same time gripped with majesty. It's hopeless and hopeful all in the same moment because there is one who is greater and who means sinners no harm. 
Oh, listen, when, when Jesus shows himself to you while you live, while you breathe, no matter how, how gripping that might be, how terrifying it might be, he means you no harm. So let's look at this. This promise he makes. And I think he's talking about the resurrection. And at the resurrection, they will, they will all, except one, be there. One will have ended his life, Judas, the traitor. But he's going to let three of them get a glimpse of what's coming. And so look at number two, the powerful kingdom of God displayed in the transfiguration of Jesus in verses two to four. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And Matthew says this about it in Matthew 17, 1 to 8. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And then Luke says this, Luke 9, 28 and following. It says that Jesus was praying there. The appearance of his face was altered. His clothing became dazzling white. Our text tells us there appeared to them, to Peter, James, and John, Elijah with Moses, talking with Jesus. Now, what is the significance of this? Elijah, remember, uh, did not die as we understand death. He was was, uh, carried away in a chariot, a fiery chariot up to heaven. Moses died, but, but... God didn't allow any mere man to bury him. He took care of Moses' burial himself. Now it's fascinating without getting too far afield here. Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land, remember? So God summoned him up on what we think was Mount Pisgah. Moses said, please, Lord, let me go. No, you're not going. Oh, Lord, please let me go. No, you're not going. Lord, please. God said, come up, I'll show you something. So he took him up on Mount Pisgah and let him see into the promised land. Geographically, when you study where this Mount of Transfiguration is, folks, it is in, it's in the area we would know as the Promised Land. When Moses comes back to fellowship with Jesus, he's in the Promised Land by the grace of God offered to sinners in Jesus. There's Moses and Elijah. What's the significance of this? Well, Moses represents, for shorthand, you would read that What's summarized in Moses and and the prophets, Moses and Elijah? Moses represents the law. He was the lawgiver. Elijah is the archetype of the prophets. He was one of the prophets, but as I said, he was carried away, did not face death as the rest of the prophets did. And so you have here Jesus talking with the law and the prophets. Jesus fellowshipping with the law and the prophets. That's powerful. Put yourself where Peter, James, and John are. They know what Moses represents, and they know what Elijah represents. And for these two to be fellowshipping with Jesus should begin to shatter any doubts they have about who Jesus was. Something else is going to happen in in this experience that's going to ultimately shatter. It's a sledgehammer. Now, it's interesting. Luke tells us this in Luke chapter 9, as he identifies Moses and Elijah as the two. In verse 31, they appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. And if you could read the Greek text in its Greek, if you could if you could read Greek, here's what you would read. They spoke to him of his echodas. Except in the Greek the letter that makes the k sound is an x, a chi. And so you and I would look at it in the English, transliterated, spelled out, and it would read Exodus. 
He spoke to them of his exodus. Moses understood that. Moses had led an exodus. He had led Israel out of Egyptian captivity into the wilderness on the way to the promised land. Elijah had departed this earth in glorious splendor. We would read later on in the scriptures that Jesus, when he rose from the grave, led captivity captive. He's talking about his exodus. He's going to lead a people out of captivity. He's going to die. And in dying, he will, he will bear in himself the sin of the people for whom he dies. And God will smite him. God will execute holy judgment and justice upon him. And he will satisfy God's divine wrath by his suffering and death in the place of many. And he will rise again from the grave three days later. And when doing so, will have led captivity captive. He does what Moses did, except Moses was not allowed to bring them into the promised land. He would do what Elijah did, but he conquered death. Elijah avoided death. What a conversation that must have been. And so you have this powerful, this transfiguration where Jesus takes on for just a few moments the beatific glorified being of himself, whom he would be when they encounter him in the resurrection. Don't touch me, he said to Mary. I've not yet ascended to my father after he had risen from the grave. Re retaking some of his divine prerogative he had surrendered that, Philippians 2 tells us, in coming and being made in the likeness of sinful man, found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But now, you see, in the resurrection, he will begin to take back some of those divine prerogatives he laid aside. He will walk through a room. He'll not be limited. They'll see him ascend after 40 days back to heaven. And then ultimately, finally, in the second coming, he will come robed in white with a robe dipped in blood, the blood of the saints perhaps, coming to say, I'm avenging the blood that is attached to my garments by those who have slain my people. Revelation says he will trample underfoot as if he is in a wine press with fury and wrath of God, the enemies of God. But for a moment, they get a glimpse of this transfigured being, variously described as we read in the passages there. You see Peter, James, and John see this is not... This is not the humble carpenter. <laughs> that's, not, that's not all he is. He's not simply the misunderstood miracle worker. This is the Son of Man. This is the Ancient of Days prophesied in the prophets. They see him for who he really is. He draws back the curtain and says, look. You no, know, brothers and sisters, you've got to see him that way. If you've been saved by grace through faith, the curtain's been drawn back some. But oh, you've got to see him that way to carry you through in these days. That's who he is now. Josh walked us through that Hebrews 1 passage. He is sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high because he himself is full of majesty. And notice real quickly, verse 3, the terrified response of Peter. Bless Peter's heart. 
The first thing he says is wonderful. Rabbi, it is good that we are here. It'd been great if he'd stopped there. <laughs> because that's, 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 that's a lesson. It's good. It's good to be drawn into the presence of Christ. It's good to know him in the fullness of his majesty. It is a good and pleasant reality. It is what we long for and look for and can't wait for. And in our most pressed moments of life, we cry out, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but he didn't stop there. <laughs> and, and it's interesting, <laughs> Mark says, and remember Mark, we, we believe Mark's taking down Peter's memoirs here. And he says, Peter didn't know what to say. Well, you know, there's a, there's a rule here. If you don't know what to say, don't. He didn't know what to say. Well, they were terrified. He was, this is his terrified response. He says, let's, let's build three tents, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Well, you see, that's, that really is denigrating the whole encounter. If he understood what he saw, as he should have understood it, there wouldn't be any need to build a tent for Moses and Elijah. They'd want to be, join, they'd want to be joining him worshiping. Another thing is it's kind of selfish because there's only three of them there, and they're part of the, the band of the 12, and, and he's not really thinking. At this point, Peter's not thinking globally, is he? He's thinking in terms of convenience, in terms of pleasure, in terms of the moment. And it's, it's a danger we have, folks, and we need to recognize that and, and avoid the impetuosity, the the thoughtless rhetoric of a, of a Peter. You see, when you see the glory of God, Isaiah saw the glory of God, and he didn't say, oh, you know, I was really, I was grieving, I was upset because my friend Uzziah died. And wouldn't it just be great now, have, having seen this, and just to stay here in the temple and Soak all this in. No. Gripping, being gripped by the glory of God pointed out his own sin, pointed out the, the condition of the, of the culture in which he lived. And, and the voice comes, who will I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says responsively to an encounter with the glory of God, here am I, send me. I will take the message. You see, that's, that's the proper response to an encounter with the, with the glorified and risen, transcendent and ascended Christ. I'll go. Peter will get to that. He, he finally gets there. Uh, Pentecost. Let's give him credit where credit's due. The Spirit gets him there at Pentecost. He didn't know what to say. He was terrified. Holy terror needs to come to us with great commission wings. Paul says it this way in Corinthians. We don't know men any longer according to the flesh. The love of Christ constrains us. We're committed to taking this encounter with the living Jesus to those who need it. In fact, Paul says in Romans 9, he says, knowing what I know now about the glory of God in the face of Christ, I... I would volunteer to be accursed. I would volunteer to be cast into hell if that meant the salvation of my brothers in Israel. A holy terror rightly embraced feeds evangelism and a desire to accomplish the Great Commission. Peter's not there yet. Well, God's not going to leave him there, thank the Lord. He doesn't leave us there, thank the Lord. Number four, the powerful statement of God in verse seven, and a cloud overshadowed them. Remember in the Old Testament when God wanted a meeting with his people in the wilderness. They had the tabernacle built there. Peter's just said, let's build three tabernacles. One for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And this Shekinah cloud that that they would have known about from the Old Testament stories that would descend upon the tabernacle saying God wants a meeting with his people. Yahweh would have his people draw near to him. This, this Shekinah overshadows them. And from it a voice. Now folks, 
I believe the last time in the Gospels we heard a voice was at Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And out of the cloud, the voice of God, this is my beloved Son. Agapitos, that's a, this is the Son of my love. This is, my, this is one whom I love like no other. This is my darling Son. And kind of, in, a, in a powerful kindness, listen to him. Brothers and sisters, it's not nearly so important what I say as it is what Jesus says. And it's not important what others say when the culture just totally loses its way and listen to Jesus. That's our, that's our command, listen to Jesus. Peter, we don't need your input. We need you to listen to what my son has to say. Oh, brothers and sisters, sometimes we let all these voices begin to press in upon us, and we need to fight the fight of faith and wade through all of that and, and listen to what does Jesus say? Are we being bigoted to, to limit our understanding of marriage to our understanding? Well, Jesus cited Genesis 2. Listen to what Jesus says. That settles the issue for us. We don't be unkind about it. It just simply settles the issue. That's where Kim Davis is. She lived a life as a profligate. Failed marriages our own testimony. But in 2011, the Lord saved her, and since that time, she's been committed to following Him. By whose authority, they ask her, by whose authority do you refuse marriage license? That was asked by a man, by the way, who drove all the way from Ohio to get a marriage license from her, as if they can't get him in Ohio somewhere. And she said, by God's authority. I'm listening to God. We listen to Jesus. Are we being unkind to suggest that Planned Parenthood is part of a, a murderous, hellish organization that profits in body parts? Listen to Jesus about life and where it comes from. Listen to him. This, this has got to be, we've got to remind one another of this today. Because good, good men, heretofore faithful men, are losing their way. They're, they're losing their nerve. They're, they're trying to find a way to meet this culture on common ground. Brothers and sisters, our, our, we've never been asked to do that. We've been commanded to listen to Jesus. Finally, these two that Peter wanted to build a tabernacle for, they're gone. Verse 8. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. What do we need? What do we need? Thank God for the law and the prophets. And we need to learn them and understand them through the, through the lenses of Jesus. What we call, the old, the old writers call the law in the hands of the mediator. Evangelical obedience. They would speak about gospel obedience. <clears throat> I ask you today, what do you need to have joy today? Do you need a Supreme Court getting it right? Do you need a lower court getting it right? Do you need to be understood by the culture around you to have joy and peace in believing? Oh, dear people, we need to be willing to look around and see only Jesus standing there with us. He is enough and more than enough to see us through. Social norms and mores will ebb and flow and they will change. They certainly have changed in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Jesus will never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's promised to be with us always, even to the ends of the earth. The Hebrew writer said it this way.
whatever things I have, I'll be content. Why? Because I know him who has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. His conclusion is this, therefore, what can man do to me? Let me tell you something, there was a measure of that coming off that mountain. There was a measure of that. Peter had it, he had it used, but when God broke in and said, this is my son, Peter, hear him. We don't need your ideas. We don't need your clever thoughts. We don't, we don't even need your, your what sound like spiritual ideas. Hear him. And they came off that mountain. Oh, he, he would blow it again, folks. He would deny Jesus by the fire at the arrest of Jesus. He would, he would show his vengeful impetuosity. He, he would, he would. But oh, Peter learned the lesson when it counted. When he stood on the day of Pentecost to that crowd, looking out, no doubt, at some that he knew would kill him if they could get their hands on him and said, you, you with wicked hands put this one to death, but God raised him up. He had a focused, laser focused, listening to Jesus. They put him in jail, threatened him. He said, you must obey God rather than men. We cannot help but speak what we've seen and heard. Listen to that coming from Peter's mouth. We cannot help but speak what we've seen and heard. Have you seen the Lord Jesus? High and lifted up. Has, he, has the Lord shown himself to you that way? Have you seen his power? Have you seen his power? Oh, folks, when we get a fresh glimpse of his power, we look around in all the powers of earth. Though this world with devils filled with threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abides still, his kingdom is forever. That's what we say when we've seen the power of the kingdom of God. But oh, it's coming. It's coming. And when it comes, when it comes, oh, you pray that the enemies of, of Christ right now would become his friends and fall and kiss him. But if not, when it comes, they will cry for rocks to fall on them and crush them, and they will say this, save us from the wrath of the Lamb. And yet we say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Have you seen the power of the kingdom of God manifested in Jesus Christ? I pray that you have. And if you haven't seen that for a while, I pray that today as we've read the scripture and as we've sung of his glory and as we've looked at this passage, that perhaps in a new and fresh and strengthening and encouraging way, you've seen again the power of the kingdom of God. And for some here, You've never seen it. You've never seen it. I pray today that you, God will fold back your blindness and show you Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, his lamb slain for you, but at the same time, the risen lamb, the lion, who is the lamb. He'll show you that. And you'll behold his glory. And you'll cry out for mercy. Know that you'll get mercy. And that you'll live while you have life to live. As a follower of Christ. Sold out to making disciples till Jesus comes. Let's pray.